thing today is part of a larger project on Ottoman Iraqi Jews and their affiliation, which I view as an active word, versus identity, which I view as a passive word. And my question is, how do they affiliate to multiple and overlapping communities as Ottoman subjects, um, as Iraqis, which is to say not Syrian, um, and as Jews as part of an international community? And so part of this project is Ottomanizing biographies, such as Menachem Saleh Effendi Daniel, Ibrahim al-Kabir, or Rabbi Yosef Haim. So today I'll be focusing on the biography of Sassoun Haskel. Uh, scholarship has treated Sassoun Haskel, who lived from 1860 to 1932, as the most famous Iraqi Jewish statesman. Yet he was also an Ottoman subject and statesman, something which scholarship has largely overlooked, or has rushed through to get to the monarchy period. It is true and well documented that he had an illustrious career. Sassoun Haskel was appointed to be the Iraqi finance minister five times in the Iraqi cabinet, and he was elected to the new parliament where he chaired the finance committee, and he was involved in shaping in what Iraq would look like too. In 1921, he was, in, he was invited as part of the very small Iraqi contingent to the Cairo conference, along with the minister of defense, Jafar al-Askari, to help determine the future of Iraq. Winston Churchill, as Secretary of State for the Colonies had organized the conference. High, Commission, High Commissioner of Iraq, Sir Percy Cox, Oriental Secretary of uh, Gertrude Bell were present as well. Sassoun Haskel had been part of the first Council of State as in, the interim governing measure before a national government was established, governed by Sir Percy Cox. On this council, Sassoun Haskel served as Minister of Finance, and he was one of the members charged with drafting an electoral law and establishing a constituent assembly for a constitution. He received much praise for his service in Iraq and also was knighted by King George V. Yet even this illustrious career as an Iraqi statesman began when he was 60 years old in 1920 on the Council of State. So I'm not going to talk about any of that. Sassoun Haskel's youth and early career occurred in Baghdad during a time when the Jewish population was steadily increasing and experiencing greater inclusion in society due to the Ottoman reforms. Thus, an examination of his fuller biography provides an illustration of the wider efflorescence and integration of the Jewish community in Ottoman Iraq and allows us to see the social, cultural, and political capital of the Jewish statesmen of the monarchy period we're drawing from. Today, in presenting his biography, I discuss what is often left out of his life and those of his generation, the rest of his career, which is to say the beginning of his career, the Ottoman years. Therefore, I argue that in addition to being an Iraqi Jewish statesman, Sassan Haskel was an Ottoman Iraqi Jewish statesman. Like many of those in his generation, he was able to distinguish himself during the Iraqi monarchy because of the long career he had already established during the twilight of the Ottoman Empire, which he did not know or nor would have expected to have been a twilight. Sir Sassan Haskel was known as Sassan Effendi for most of his life and is named as such in the Ottoman archives and he signs it as such in his newspaper articles. And in this capacity, as an Ottoman Iraqi Jewish imperial citizen, I would like to discuss the activities and tensions of his multiple affiliations today. Sassoun Effendi was born to a family known for its wealth and commercial ties in Baghdad in 1860. His father, Haskal bin Shlomo, was a haham and an authority on halakha. As a boy, Sassoun Effendi began his education in the Alliance Israelite Universelle School for Boys that had built in, been built in Baghdad in 1864. The Alliance School in Baghdad had been known for its rough curriculum, particularly because its students were required to learn at least five languages. Later in life, Sassoun Effendi was often praised for his fluency in these multiple languages. The foundations for his linguistic cap capabilities seem to be from this Alliance schooling. In early 1877, he went to Istanbul, accompanied by his uncle, Menachem Saleh Effendi Daniel, who was recently elected deputy for Baghdad in the new Ottoman parliament. Baghdad was known for having two Jewish deputies over the course in the parliamentary sessions. In Istanbul, Sassoun Effendi attended the imperial school, the Galatasaray Lisezi, where instruction was in Ottoman Turkish and French. And then he went on to Vienna, where he studied in the Consular Academy, the former Imperial Royal Academy of Oriental Languages. After his graduation from the academy, he spent time in Berlin and in London. He returned to the Ottoman Empire to attend law school in Istanbul and went back to Baghdad. 
1884, he was appointed to be the translator, the Tejuman, in the Provincial Translation Office in Baghdad. His participation in local and regional, uh, pardon, local and regional levels of government, along with the presence of several other Jewish individuals, and it must be mentioned, Christian individuals, as council members and committee secretaries, demonstrates the widening inclusion of non-Muslims in Ottoman participatory, participatory governance, all part of what is known as the Ottoman Tanzimat reforms. In 1884, an examination of the yearbook register for, for the Baghdad province, the Salname, reveals Sassoun Effendi as employed by the Ottoman government, as well as fellow Jew, Yusuf Haskal Shamtob, alongside the many Mohammed Effendis and Abdul Mahdi Beys. Thus, according to the Salnames of Baghdad, Sassoun Effendi worked as the provincial translator for 20 years, until 1904. This role was important and very influential because he functioned as the prime intermediary between the various governors during this time and the other administrators sent from, 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 sent from Istanbul who did not know Arabic and the local inhabitants who did not know Ottoman Turkish. As well, this role was important because he was the acting intermediary between governors, the same governors, and the offices of the Baghdad foreign consuls. So his language skills in Arabic, Ottoman Turkish, Persian, French, German, and English served him quite well. In 1905, according to the Salname, the yearbook, the provincial yearbook, he became the secretary for the newly formed Hamidiyya Steamship Administration, the Hamidiyya Vapuru Edarisi, a position he held for at least two years. The Hamidiyya Steamship Administration was formed by Sultan Abdul Hamid II's Privy Purse Commission. The new Hamidiyya company was authorized to operate six steamers on the Tigris between Baghdad and Basra in 1905 while well, the British Lynch Company had a concession to operate only two steamers on the Tigris at this time. It is very possible that Sassoon Effendi's role within the Ottoman-owned Amandia Steamship Administration affected his actions on an imperial scale several years later, which I will mention shortly. In December 1908, following the July 1908 Young Turk Revolution, he was elected to the Ottoman Parliament representing Baghdad City, following in the steps of his uncle several years before. The Istanbul-based newspaper Tanin, the Echo, reported on Baghdad province representatives in January 1909, introducing them to its readership in the capital, along with a vote count, and I quote, and one of our editors, Baban Zade Ismail Hakib Bey, was elected with 98 votes, the religious scholar Alusi Zade Haji Ali Effendi was elected with 88 votes, one of the notables of the Jewish community, Sassoon Effendi, elected with 62 votes, and all the elected Japanese would join together when they are ready to depart for Istanbul. End quote. Being a Sunni Muslim empire, it was significant that a Shi'i member from Karbala was elected in this Iraqi delegation, but it was only Sassoun Effendi from Baghdad who was identified by his religion in the newspaper article, using the polite terminology, Musevi Milatindan, of the Mosaic community, instead of the more trite Yahudi in Ottoman Turkish. The fact that it was noteworthy in the newspapers underscores the inclusion of non Muslims in the Ottoman parliament without mandatory quotas. Unlike the previous system of representative government, such as the provincial councils, which did have mandatory inclusive quotas for non-Muslim members. Therefore, Jewish Sassoon Effendi was elected to an imperial office by his peers, fellow inhabitants of the Iraqi provinces. To be elected to the parliament, candidates had to meet a few, few requirements before they could stand for election. They had to be male, they had to be older than 30, own land, pay taxes, not be convicted, enjoy full rights, which is not to be enslaved, not be under foreigners' employment, and they had to be able to function well in Ottoman Turkish. Now, there were many male Ottoman subjects who could not stand for parliament election from the provinces uh, or outside of um, Istanbul because they did not meet the Ottoman Turkish language requirement. So as a Jewish man from Baghdad, Sassoon Effendi was able to have a political career locally and in Istanbul because of his family's wealth and his own solid pursuit of education and language. With his election to the Ottoman parliament, Sassoon Effendi had allied himself with the Committee of Union Progress Party, the CUP. The CUP was the party that had orchestrated the Young Turk Revolution in July 1908, that had forced the Sultan to restore the constitution in parliament. These revolutionaries were not as liberal as the slogans of liberty, equality, fraternity, and justice that they had banded about, their aim was to protect the empire from separatism and foreign intervention. 
Sassoon Effendi was not the only Jewish deputy in the Ottoman parliament, but he was the only Jewish deputy from an Arab province. The three other Jewish deputies, Emmanuel Karasu from Salonika, Nisim Masliah from Izmir, and Alba Vitali Faradje from Istanbul, all hailing from the Eastern Mediterranean, all educated in the Alliance schools, uh, and they also all maintained their loyalty to the CUP. Their views on Zionism are outside the scope of this paper, but I will touch on Sassoon Effendi's shortly. During 1909, the political environment began to change in the empire. There was a counter coup and its quashing in April in Istanbul, and the subsequent deposition of Sultan Abdelhamid II and the accession of his brother Mehmet Rashad V. Within party politics, the moderate liberal party formed and put our opposition to the CUP, particularly concerning the platform of decentralization. Decentralization became popular in the Arab provinces, like Iraq particularly. Arab deputies viewed the decentralist platforms as reflecting more of the regional way of life, especially regarding language policies. On the ballot, however, Sassoon Effendi never officially defected from the CUP. However, when he was faced with issues that he understood negatively affected his constituents, he acted on them, even if they countered the wishes of the ruling elites in Istanbul. In the parliament's sessions, Sassoon Effendi's usual participation was reporting de uh, pardon, developments from the committees he was on, such as the Budget Committee, which oversaw the Sultan's Privy Purse Commission, and the Ottoman Postal and Telegraph Administration. He was not a long-winded speaker, nor did he make the impassioned speeches that some of the other representatives made at times. He <clears throat> rarely spoke up beyond commenting on committee work to which he was appointed, Yet, from articles in contemporary domestic and foreign press, it is known that he had opinions about politically charged topics. He just did not share them when the topics were raised in Parliament. While a representative, he shared his political opinions on two issues. Uh, the investment of foreign capital and navigation rights on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and Zionist collective settlement within the Ottoman Empire. Examining these two issues, among many others, demonstrates Sassoon Effendi's characteristic leadership, for which he was later known and praised, as well as illustrates issues of tension in identity politics and multiple affiliation as an Ottoman Iraqi Jew. Within these examples, I look at how he was presented or how he positioned himself while discussing these issues as an Iraqi or as a Jew and while acting as an Ottoman subject by, by being in the parliament. The Lynch affair was one example of his breaking rank with the CUP and the, Jew, and the other Jewish deputies in parliament. Uh, the Lynch affair also led to the solidarity between all the Iraqi deputies, regardless of their political affiliation, because by 1909, several of them had moved away from the CUP and affiliated with the moderate Liberal Party. It was his first Iraq first orientation. In 1909, the CUP governed Ottoman cabinet approved a project that would see an amalgamation of the Ottoman Nahriya steamer line with the, Brinch, with, with the British Lynch Company. In practice, this project meant the Lynch Company's absorption of the Nahariya would result in the Lynch Company's monopoly of navigation rights on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. This business agreement could take place because in the summer of 1909, the privy purse of the Sultan was to be transferred to the Ministry of Finance, and the steamers that had been part of the property of the Sultan's privy purse would be transferred over to the government cabinet. The Iraqi deputies, Sassoon Effendi included, were concerned about the effects that this concession would have on local commerce, including British trade advantage, ensuing British political designs, and Arab tribal disturbances along the rivers. Tribesmen and merchants from all backgrounds, including Jews, protested and sent numerous tele telegrams, and deputies raised counterproposals in Parliament. Sassoon Effendi himself journeyed in the Lower Tigris, notifying merchants and notables of the dangers that implementing this scheme would bring. Rioting also occurred, serious enough for Istanbul con to consider issuing martial law in Baghdad and Basra. Sassoon Effendi never spoke on this issue in Parliament sessions. His fellow deputy from Baghdad and former editor of the Istanbul newspaper Tanin, Babanzade Isma Hakil Bey, spoke for all the Iraqi representatives that Britain was already too powerful in Iraq. Control of the river system would be too much. Sassoon Effendi was re is recorded as being present in the sessions where this issue is raised, and all the deputies from Iraq were mentioned in being collective agreement. Sassoon Effendi's opinions about this issue are known to us because he published them, and not just for an Ottoman Iraqi audience. In May 1909, he wrote an article for the newspaper Tanin in Istanbul concerning the Lynch Company's monopoly scheme. In this article, titled Seafaring on the Tigris, Serisafa in Dijlede, 
he warned the consumers of Tanin of the negative outcomes of this concession. First, he provided an entire history of Ottoman navigation on the Tigris, beginning in the 1850s, when the first steamship was brought and when the first commercial line was established, and mentioning when the Ottoman government granted permission for the British Splinch Company to navigate the Tigris with two steamboats in the 1880s. Then concerning the proposal of the concession the, in 1909, Sassoon Effendi called the transfer of Iraq's commerce to the hands of a foreign company pure corruption and put forth the argument that the government should grant free, free navigation rights to all Ottoman subjects, which would be a natural consequence of increasing trade transport demands, decreasing fare and freight prices because of the numbers of the available steamboats and companies. His solution, as he saw it, was a matter of being a patriot. By writing this article in Ottoman Turkish and publishing it in an Istanbul newspaper, he made what he understood as a local and regional Iraqi issue into an imperial issue. Ultimately, the deal between the Lynch Company and the Ottoman government collapsed due to a no confident vote in parliament. All but four Arab deputies abstained, and the Grand Vizier resigned. Sassoon Effendi had no problem offering his candid opinions and sharing his regional concerns in the press. It is curious that he did not use his parliamentary platform to do so about the Lynch affair. There is no indication it had to do with his Jewish identity or not. He was not completely inactive. Rather, he did use the press to voice his opinions, which actually reached a wider population, but also could have been riskier because of the always changing censorship laws. Another topic debated in parliament was Zionism and the effects of Zionist immigration and colonization of Ottoman Palestine. These heated debates began to occur in the parliament sessions in 1911, and ranged from decentralists claiming the increased Jewish settlement in Arab lands came from the government's passive attention to the Arab provinces to criticisms of Zionist aims. Current camps and scholarship so far either have examined polarized Arab Zionist debates or tensions between Ottoman nation and Jewish autonomy. As an Ottoman Iraqi Jew and member of parliament, Sassoon Effendi does not exactly fit into these scholarship models, as I'll illustrate. But first, Sassoon Effendi was included as a member of the Ottoman delegation to Paris and London in 1909. Other members of this delegation included fellow Jewish deputy Nisim Masliah of Izmir and several other deputies from the Arab provinces, including Rahib al Khalidi of Jerusalem. Sassoon Effendi was the only one from Iraq. There was great interest in the Ottoman deputies while they were in London on this state visit. And just like in the Ottoman press, newspapers paid attention to the fact that they were not all Muslim. London's Jewish Chronicle was particularly delighted by the inclusion of the two Jewish members, as well as the presence of the Alliance-educated not-Jewish member from Edirne, Dr. Reza Tafik, who knew Hebrew and Ladino. And the Jewish Chronicle reported to its readers on the entirety of the delegate's visit, something the Jewish Chronicle might not have done if the, readers, if the members had not been Jewish. While the delegation was in London, the Jewish Chronicle reporting staff featured a special interview with Nisim Masliah and Sassoon Effendi. A major focus of the interviews with the Ottoman deputies, and indeed also Dr. Riza Tafiq, who they almost treated as an honorary Jewish deputy, was the question of Zionist Jewish settlement in the Ottoman Empire. As he informed the Jewish Chronicle reporter, Sassoon Effendi was against the spread of Zionism in the Ottoman Empire, and I quote, I am afraid of a great catastrophe if the suspicions of Jewish loyalty engendered by Zionism should grow stronger, end quote. He continued, though, signaling his Iraqi background by acknowledging there were many regions in the Ottoman Empire that could accommodate immigrants, not just Palestine, but argued why Iraq would not be an option for receiving large immigrant immigration populations because of its current immigration scheme, which would not be able to sustain increased population growth. When asked about the possibility of the Ottoman Sultan granting autonomy to Jewish immigrants in Palestine, Sassoon Effendi was quite clear, and I quote, why should Turkey give autonomy to the Jews in one of her provinces?" End quote. The staff reporter responded by answering that Jewish immigra immigration will take greater interest in a colony they themselves govern and make it a success, and that if Jews are merely allowed to settle as ordinary citizens without autonomy, they may as well emigrate to America or elsewhere. And to these arguments, Sassoon Effendi remarked, and I quote, well, let them go to America. We don't mind. And he continued, there's no chance for Zionism. It creates a Jewish question, because the Zionists would demand autonomy for Palestine, and that would create a Jewish question. The Ottoman Jews have always been devoted to Turkey as their fatherland. They never applied to foreign governments for protection, and the Turks had every confidence in them, because they knew that the Jews had no separatist objects in view, 
Now, when you come talk to Autonomy for Jews, you create immediately a political question, end quote. The significance of his interview and sharing of opinions that were quite anti-Zionist is that his voice was absent from the heated Ottoman parliament debates in 1911 about Zionist settlement in Palestine. The, voice, the points, though, that he has on record making in the Jewish Chronicle in 1909 are reflected in his fellow Arab deputies' arguments in 1911 in the parliament about loyalty, autonomy, and separatism. Sassoon Effendi represents the parts of the tensions that are now getting collapsed in some of the scholarship categorizations of Arab versus Zionist or Ottoman nation vis-a-vis -vis Jewish subjecthood. And moreover, he was not alone in his views. Former Ottoman Baghdad deputy Menachem Saleh, Salah Effendi Daniel expressed similar concerns about Jewish immigration to Arab land in the Ottoman Empire. In conclusion, through a reconsideration of Sassoon Haskell's biography, wherein his career began long before the First World War, he did not suddenly become Iraqi with the creation of the nation state in 1921, but rather encountered and engaged with the regional affiliation and civic process during the late Ottoman period and as an Ottoman subject. His activities in the Ottoman parliament were in the interest of his Iraqi constituents, but he also had to navigate being boxed in as one of the Jewish representatives and how his decisions would reflect on his co-religionists for better or for worse. Ottomanizing his biography informs how he framed the periodization and social ties in modern history of Iraqi Jews. Thank you very much. <laughs>